Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. In this video, I'm going to talk all about um, a way I really feel that we can actually crush the coronavirus, and that is using uh, CO2 sensors to measure the carbon dioxide level indoors. Outdoors right now, it's about 419 parts per million, but of course that varies a little with uh, latitude and among other things. But when you go inside, if you're in, a, if you're in an inside space, then the ventilation amount is key to determining um, what the CO2 levels will be inside. The number of people in the room and um, size of the room and all of these factors. So a perfect way, a perfect metric to figure out how much of the coronavirus is in that room is to look at the CO2 number as a proxy. And if it's down low, if it's close to external levels, then you've got sufficient, excel like excellent ventilation in that room and your risk is very much reduced, especially wearing masks indoors as well. What I'd like to see, I'm convinced that if all indoor public spaces monitored their CO2 levels and there were guidelines or regulations by governments to necessitate that that number is below a certain level. So let's say, you know, external is 420 parts per million roughly. You could say in an indoor space in a school or a nursing home or a restaurant you know, or any public space that the level needed to be, um, you know, you could pick 800 or 600 parts per million, right? And uh, you could have a regulation and say, if the number goes above that level, then there's a problem in that indoor space. You need to either open windows if you can, or reduce the number of people in the space or do other things. So this is a perfect proxy or measurement you know, we're not measuring the virus directly, but whenever a person exhales, they're putting CO2 into the atmosphere. If it's in a compact space, that CO2 level goes up. When you're exhaling the virus particles, the coronavirus particles, you, um, they're aerosolized, so it's an airborne transmission. You know, we know this, all the evidence is showing this. We knew this from the 1918 Spanish, so-called Spanish uh, flu. So you're exhaling these aerosols, so water droplets containing the virus and virus particles free, but most of them would be bound up into water droplets. And in the winter, uh, it's very dry in indoor spaces and that water, that aerosolized um, water, water particles, very tiny water particles evaporate. So then you're just left with the virus particles, which are even smaller, floating around in the room, and they will stay in an unventilated room for hours and hours out and hours. So it's very important that there's a lot of air exchange. And you could actually uh, figure out the rebreathe fraction. And if the CO2 level in a space is, indoor space, is 800 parts per million, um, you can calculate that that means that your rebreathing about 1% of the air that other people have breathed out. And this, of course, is very concerning um, in a pandemic. Okay, so, uh, so I think, um, you know, all nursing homes, all long-term care homes, all hospitals, all indoor spaces, restaurants, everything needs to have a way to measure CO2 levels and to determine if that indoor space is safe. And then we can reopen economies and uh, crush this, this virus, okay? In the longer term, um, I'd like to see these, you know, as the price goes down of these CO2 detectors, I'd love to see them on um, Fit, Fitbits, on Garmin smartwatches, on the phone, okay? There's no reason why your cell phone can't have a little CO2 detector. And I'll talk a little bit about how it is. Basically, you're shining an infrared light through a path length of the gas, and it's absorbed, and you know the length, and you know the absorption line, because you know the 
wavelength or frequency band of the lights or of the light source or laser, little laser diode, little laser di detector, and you could very accurately determine that CO2 level. And it could be in your smartphone, could be in in uh, you know in a necklace. It could be in any any of these wearables. And eventually, when people have them. Um, then this virus and any other viruses that come along, their airborne transmission, we can um, conquer them and not have this not shut down economy. So, so this is vital, vital information. So let's go into the, into the uh, some of the details. I've actually um, let me get into the into the nitty gritty, but I wanted to stress that, um, and. Uh, I'll start doing more videos again. I've had a little bit of a breather. I've been reading Stephen King. This is Sleeping Beauties. I just finished uh, Thinner. Um, I just finished The Running Man. I've read about 15. I think this is the 15th um, Stephen King. So I'll have to start writing some cli climate horror uh, <laughs> soon before he does. <laughs> he, he probably, he should. It's a, it's a great topic to write about. Okay, so this is a paper. This is an article that just came out, an excellent article in the Washington Post. So this uh, CO2 detection to monitor indoor spaces is becoming um, a major factor, as it should be. It's, it's a way to conquer the virus. So um, this was my last um, blog. I was talking about damage to the climate and environmental risks. So my site is paulbeckwith.net. Please consider donating to support my videos. Okay, so I tweeted this out and, and um, pegged it. Um, this is the article that I'm going to discuss in detail. The coronavirus is airborne. Okay, vital information. Now, I've been trying to get this out to the public since the pandemic started. So for, you know, not quite a year, nine months, 10 months, and finally, it's getting public awareness. Um, okay, there's, if you go hashtag COVID CO2, do a search for that in Twitter, then you see all of these um, articles. This is the article I posted. This is an example of a CO2 detector monitoring, and it gives a CO2 level here. Um, there's uh, more information, um, CO2 detectors in the classroom. Let me just keep going here. Okay, um, it updated, there was a whole bunch. So there's another type of detector. Um, there was a good plot here I wanted to show you, but there's just too many posts on this site. Let me just go down. Okay, so you can get a graph of the concentration over time. I did this um, years ago. I have a CO2 detector, an old one, that is that you need to plug in. So. Um, I'm in the market to, to buy a portable one. This is an example of a restaurant um, where the ventilation was poor, or, or actually a, uh, a store where the ventilation was poor, and there was a fan at the front blowing air back in, and the, the doors were closed. That was the level. The fan blowing air back in was shut off, and the back door was open, cross ventilation, and that was the level. So the risk is much, much lower in this indoor environment than in that one. Okay, here, here's a good example. Um, this is a, uh, a high school in Sydney, Australia. One teacher, 25 kids, an ordinary morning. So this is the CO2 level. Okay, with the detector, the person had it in their car. In a car, it went way, way up, just to crack windows. Getting out of the car, walking to class. 25 kids, window closed, CO2 ra climbs rapidly, less than an hour, up to 1350 ppm. Windows opened, look at the decline to under 500 parts per million here. Okay, and then throughout the day it stayed very low. This is a very, very risky environment for, for COVID. Even people wearing masks can get, um, can, can, uh, can catch it. This is a very, very safe, much safer environment for COVID. So CO2 is a proxy for how well the room is ventilated and how safe you'll be in an in indoor space. Okay, so, um, okay, so 
I, I uh, went and got uh, some food this morning. Now, there's no seating allowed inside right now, but this is a place, a local place called Kettleman's Bagels. And these are all doors. This used to be a garage. These are all doors that open up. So in the winter, you have them open just a crack. In the summer, they're wide open. And you need a CO2 detector in here and you could measure the safety um, inside this business. This is another place. Um, you know, we've been in shutdown since, since Christmas, essentially. So all these places have been closed. But when we're out of shutdown, I often go to this diner and I always sit on this table here or this table here. You can see there's a whole, this window here, uh, it, the, these doors open up, okay? They, they fold open, the whole thing opens up. And uh, you don't do that in the middle of the winter, you'd freeze, but you just have it open a crack and I sit in these particular spaces. I don't sit anywhere else when I go into this place. Okay, uh, it, we're not talking about carbon monoxide. I googled, if you do a Google search for carbon dioxide detectors, they talk a lot about carbon monoxide here. I don't know why this comes up. Don't confuse the two. The carbon monoxide detectors are good indoors for if, for for you know determining if there's CO carbon monoxide big problem you got to get out if your if your boiler or natural gas furnace is not having is not working properly and it can be very deadly inside we're talking about CO2 okay so don't mix up the the two now okay so I'll talk all about this article but first of all I want to show well I'll get I'm going to have to do a sec a second video cuz I'm it's taking a bit longer than I thought um, but, you know, this is a guy, this is a guy who cal calculated the rebreathe fraction of air. So he determined a whole bunch of, he did it over, over a whole bunch of Twitter. So you can look, if you're on Twitter, look up Dr. Richard Corsi, look at this thread from October 12th. And he figures out that with 800 parts per million indoor CO2 level, you're breathing about 1% of the air that is, that other people have breathed in that space. And like I said, this is very problematic in a pandemic. Um, the sensor, how does it work? You have a lamp or a laser, infrared. The gas goes in here and out here. And the gas, uh, so the air absorbs. This is tuned to the wavelengths so that's absorbed on a strong CO2 absorption line. And you detect how much gets through. Um, and uh, you can figure out the, the CO2 level. Okay, so this company, CO2 Meter, they make a lot of these devices. And like I say, I'll be checking prices. There's a good, uh, good stuff here on the progression of these detectors, like how you can fold the light and use waveguides, etc., to have very, very compact and inexpensive devices. And um, I also want to show you uh, this guy here. Okay, so this is an article from a few months ago. There was an indoor, there was a live concert in uh, Tokyo. Okay, so these are performers and they had a big screen and they had the CO2 level. And when the CO2 level, the, when it was fine at green, when this thing went over about 800, when it went higher, oh, when it went over a thousand parts per million, then it turned red. And a performer could actually breathe in the sensor and then it would go to red and then quickly go back to green because it was well ventilated. So they actually showed that they kept the screen up during a live indoor concert in Japan and uh, it worked very well. Okay, these screens are being installed at concert venues, restaurants, airports, and other public spaces. So this is even better than having a small detector. Um, you just have a large detector and everybody in the room can see it. Um, and they're working on um, smaller and smaller detectors, etc. But this is a way we can reopen the economy and uh, destroy the uh, coronavirus. So send this info to any and all of your friends, politicians. If you have, uh, if you know people of influence, get the information out there. Okay, and uh, you know, let's let's do this. I mean, we you know, small businesses, people are being affected all around the world. Um, with these shutdowns and, you know, there's a lot of mental health issues and it's going to be an epidemic of that. And uh, anyway, so in the, I'm going to go through this article in detail in the next video. 
Thanks for listening and please consider donating to support my work. Bye for now.